Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this week's uh, Building Power. I am your host, Zakia Sankara Jabbar. I'm excited to welcome Mr. Traron Cruz. Uh, Traron Cruz is the co-chair of the Green Party of the United States, as well as the co-chair of the National Green Party Black Caucus. In 2019, he was elected chair of the Minnesota Green uh, Party. He is also chair of the St. Paul Recovery Act Steering Committee and a lead organizer of Black Lives Matter Minnesota. Welcome, Traron. Thanks so much for joining Building Power today. Please just, you know, let us know, tell the audience a little bit more about yourself and um, how you got into doing all this amazing work in Minnesota. Uh, I'm honored to be here. Thank you for having me today to give us an opportunity to talk about uh, reparations in the St. Paul Recovery Act. I, um, a few years ago, I had ran for mayor and I ran for city council. And both times I was running on a reparatory justice platform. In 2017, I found a better, um, I met somebody who had something they were working on called the DC Recovery Act. And he gave me the blueprint and basically what they wanted to do. They wanted to put taxes on anything that our ancestors had. Sugar, tobacco, cotton. Uh, our ancestors put um, hands touched those and, th and this made America great. And the taxes from the cotton, the tobacco sat in the United States Treasury and created interest and, and made America great. So. Uh, So you guys just recently got something passed um, at the St. Paul city level. Uh, and it looks like you guys got what's called a commission established um, to look at reparations specifically. Is it for specifically descendants of enslaved Africans and indigenous populations or just um, descendants of, of enslaved uh, Africans in the United States? Can you share a little uh, bit more about that? Mm -hmm. This this one is actually for the descendants of slavery. So if your ancestors went through slavery, uh, the lynching period, Jim Crow, uh, mass incarceration, it, it would be for that. Uh, so ours is specifically focused on uh, the descendants of chattel slavery. But there are a lot of initiatives here that um, that are working on, like the land back campaigns that our Native American brothers and sisters are working on. We're definitely in solidarity with them on that. Absolutely, solidarity so, uh, is key. Thank you uh, so much for sharing this. So um, can you tell us like, is it kind of like what's going on at the United States uh, Congress level, HR 40, is this just a study that St. Paul is doing? And I love the fact, thank you for not just you know, including slavery, but we know that uh, white supremacy and, and, and you know, kind of like this colonization of black folks and blackness has continued to evolve uh, since the um, Emancipation Proclamation. So I appreciate that you all were cognizant enough to even include like mass incarceration, right? To include all of those other things that have continued to happen. Um, share more about, is this a commission? Just what, what's what's happening now since it passed? So this is um, right now. The real work is is the work is uh, starting right now. So basically uh, talking to people like yourselves and getting the word out and educating people about what the St. Paul Recovery Act is when the applications will be out April 1st. So if you're in Minnesota or you're in St. Paul right now, you will go to uh, St. Paul gov. There should be a, a page about the St. Paul Recovery Act there at the end of this week. I believe at the end of this week and you'll be able to sign up to be able to sit on the commission. So it's called it's called a LAC is a legislative advisory commission and they will start doing the work um, to get ready to form the actual commission. And a lot of that work is going to be um, in 
I think there was reasons why the city the city council didn't just want this sitting on the shelf. They wanted to start moving on it uh, quickly. So that's why they created, had this process in place. Um, and so basically it's kind of like HR 40 at the local level, but it, I, I feel like it has a little, a little more teeth in it because it sets up a permanent commission inside the St. Paul city council that will be there permanently. And uh, we'll be looking at but things like budgets. We'll be looking at different departments. And um, so looking at the small business, uh, looking at the housing authority and making sure that the housing authority is doing things through a reparatory lens, things like that, making sure all our departments, all the city departments, the water department, everything has a reparatory justice lens to it um, going forward. So though, that's kind of how the LAC will be uh, set up. The resolution also calls for long-term and short-term strategies too. So we know with COVID and how we're being uh, hit by COVID that we need some immediate relief for black people. And we don't have a lot of time, you know, five, 10 years down the road, we need some things to happen right now. Um, so we're really excited about this, um, but it's, 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 a lot of, it's gonna be a lot of work and we're gonna need um, some of the best and brightest minds of St. Paul to come together. The mayor said uh, everybody has to have hands on on this and, and we're excited about that. If yeah, I could just- um, Absolutely, you keep going. No, keep going. So the, 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 the pre, the legislate, the Recovery Act, so on January 13th, 2021, the city of St. Paul apologized for holding Dredd and Harriet Scott in military slavery from, from 1836 to 1838. The Scots were among the enslaved people taken to their army, taken by their army owners to Fort Snelling in the 1830s. And then uh, racial covenants, I don't know, a lot of people might not know, but Jim Crow was might have been exported from Minnesota to the South. So according to mapping- Ooh, Say more about that. According to Mapping St. Paul, racial covenants were tools used by real estate developers to prevent people of color from buying or occupying property, often just a few lines of text. These covenants were inserted into warranty deeds across the country. These real estate contracts were powerful tools for segregationists. Real estate developers and public officials used private property transactions to build a hidden system of American apartheid during the 19th century. So in Minneapolis, there's a, if you guys haven't seen it yet, there's a, a documentary called Jim Crow of the North, and it talks about racial covenants. And racial covenants were like deeds or mortgages that said that you can't sell this house to a black person. So say you were working at Ford, say you were working at Gillette in the 60s, in the 70s here in St. Paul or Minneapolis, and you could afford to buy a house on Lake Calhoun, or you could afford to buy a house on Lincoln Avenue, but because if you're black, the mortgage or the deeds says that you can't sell that house to a black person. And we know that real estate creates generational wealth and that houses are passed down from generation to generation. And they also build equity. And that's how you are able to send your children to college and other, and just other financial investments. But that through these covenants that was stolen from black men and souls. And it was stolen from black people across the country. So um, this is something that we're gonna be addressing. Right now they're doing one, the one in Minneapolis is completed. So now they're starting the one here in St. Paul. So we wanna tie that work into the work we're doing with the uh, St. Paul Recovery Act because, so with um, basically whites have 90% of the wealth, blacks have 2.6% of the wealth in America. So you're talking about like a hundred trillion dollars. Uh -huh. You gotta say that number experience. again. You can't you can't just run <laughs> past those kind of numbers. You gotta say that again. Make sure people heard that. Run that again. One hundred trillion dollars compared to two point six trillion dollars. So I know we always say we gotta do for self and pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, but the, the racial wealth gap is so substantial that we, we're gonna need a lot of bootstraps to, to, to close that. And also what you're seeing, millennials have 3% of the wealth. That's millennials, period. We're not talking about 
uh, millennials who are descendants of slavery. But there's a wealth transfer about to happen. So that money is going to be transferred to the younger whites, you know, and then that 2.6, we're going to transfer that to the next generation of uh, the descendants of slavery. So this is, these are some, these are some of the reasons why reparations is so important and how institutional racism has caused poverty or has played a role in creating a racial wealth gap in America. It's not that black people are lazy. It's not that we're stupid. It's not that we're dumb or that we don't want to work. There are policies and procedures that are put in place or that are built into the system to make things unequitable. And we think the St. Paul Recovery Act is a good way to start uh, addressing some of the systemic some of the systemic problems in um, here in the city of St. Paul, St. Paul has one of the biggest education gaps in America. Yes. Um, so one thing that we're interested in, and none of these things are set in stones. These are just some of the ideals. The commission will be doing the work. Um, also, the city of St. Paul apologized for the destruction of the Rondo community on January 13th, 2021, Rondo the St. Paul community. City Council. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Rondo, the Rondo community of St. Paul, Minnesota was a thriving black community with black businesses and homeowners. The Rondo community was destroyed by the construction of the I-94 freeway. So on January 13th, 2021, the St. Paul City Council passed the St. Paul Recovery Act reparations resolution, which also apologized for the destruction of the Rondo community via the construction of the I-94 uh, freeway. You know, I'm trying to hold myself back here from being uh, emotional because you. it's sad that you got to explain that Black people are not lazy. It's sad that you got to explain that it's not our fault that the racial wealth gap that exists the way that it does, that is not our fault. Because okay. there's so much propaganda out there about what we don't deserve. We're lazy. We're this. We're that. And some people, even in our own community, brother, you know, they, they have succumbed to these ideas and this propaganda and they believe it. And like what I appreciate about the work that you are doing, which is why I was so excited to have you today, is that you're, you're putting the onus back on who it deserves to be on. It's the policymakers. Poverty in this country is not a individual defect. It is about policies and practice. You see what I'm saying? And so. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and so, yeah, go ahead. Jump back in because I know you got a lot to share. So just kind of piggybacking off what you were saying, um, the racial wealth gap, uh, according to the Brookings Institute, at $171,000, the net worth of a typical white family is nearly 10 times greater than that of a black family, which is $17,150,000. Um, and not only that, I mean, so we, we have to talk about the fact that the government specifically chose thriving black communities. This is just that Rondo neighborhood. That just didn't happen in Minnesota. They did it in LA. They did it even in Dayton, Ohio, where I lived yes. for 20 years. They did it literally all over the country in thriving black neighborhoods with black thriving black businesses and everything. The government used eminent domain, right? And, and created the highway system through our communities, which decimated our economic base. So we have a history of actually so-called bootstrapping, if you feel me. You know what Absolutely. I'm saying? Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma was bootstrapping. Ain't nobody That's gave right. us nothing. We had That's to right. work for that. And the two instances, I got to be really clear, the two instances where the United States government has dropped a bomb domestically has been on black people. That's right. That was in Tulsa and on Move in 1989 in 1985 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So so many people who 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 say negative things about black people not this and black people not that. I fear they don't understand the history of our actual bootstrapping. How many times do we have to bootstrap our way for a bomb to be dropped on our community by our own government? 
And that and that's the thing. So we're we're bootstrapping, but like you just said, then you practice white violence against us and economic violence against us, and then tell us to pull ourselves up by our bootstrap, which is which is insane. And then when you look at some of these um the stimulus package that just came out, there was and I'm proud, I'm happy for my Native American brothers and sisters, but there was 30 billion earmarked just for them. So we need going back to policies. When we do elect people, we have to make sure that when they're at the table for us, that they're going to fight and make sure that we get our fair share of the pie. And that, and, and a lot of times that's not happening with the previous stimulus package. Because okay, of wait a minute, wait a minute. I I'm sorry. There was how much in there for our indigenous brothers and sisters in this stimulus package? How much? $30 billion. I hadn't some of heard it for COVID that. relief. Go through the stimulus package when you guys get some time. Uh, even the last stimulus package where... They didn't have nothing in there for black businesses that we lost 41% of black-owned businesses during COVID. Wasn't nothing in there for that? There's not a whole lot in there for us. And so we need to be really advocating for this. There was $5 billion for farmers. For, but not were, black farmers, just for farmers across the board for low resource farmers but they use the terminology they use the discrimination they use the discrimination that black farmers have went through to set up this five billion dollars for debt relief so the flat farmers can get it and they can pay off their debt but they use the story of discrimination that our ancestors lost millions and millions and millions of acres of land since the yes. early 1900s i think we only have about two you know, we're down, we don't have a lot of the acres that we lost. Um, so they put that five billion up, but uh, Mitch McConnell called it reparations. But however, no, if you did, no, if he you, didn't. <laughs> if you look at it, uh, Asian farmers can get it, Latino farmers can get it. Uh, pretty much, if it says for low resource farmers, and that could be any anybody, right? So it's very important, and that's why I like the St. Paul, uh, this resolution that we, we put together is very, very specific about who, who it's targeting. Uh, according to Demos, the U.S. racial wealth gap is substantial and is driven by public policies decisions. So the U.S. racial wealth gap, according to Demos, is driven by public policy decisions and public policy decisions are made by lawmakers. Whites have 90% of the wealth, blacks have just under 3% of the wealth in America. 400 years of racist public policies at the state and federal level drive the racial wealth gap in the United States. So I, I didn't know I was gonna get mad on this show. You didn't sit up here and made me mad. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> Like, because I'm listening to you just rolling off this information, and I'm just like, wow, the disrespect, yeah. you know. It is, it, but and, 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 and let me be really clear indigenous brothers and sisters deserve that money. Let absolutely. me be really, really clear. The problem is, is that America has enough to do right by all of us. Yes, that's what that's that's what makes me mad. I'm not into fighting other oppressed communities. No. And they, 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 uh, Europeans came over here and stole their whole nation. So absolutely, you feel me? Absolutely. But, but they also used our ancestors to build their wealth. Mm. We were literally our ancestors were the commodity. That's right. You know what I'm saying? And so yes. the United States has enough <laughs> to go around, if you will. They have enough to do right by all of us. And I think that's what's really um that's what's really making me upset about this thing. And 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 I'm sorry, but I got some questions for the Congressional Black Caucus. Um who's fighting for us? I mean, are y'all just oh, let's look, this is my work show. So let me uh I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't want to get like, you in trouble. I'm serious. I'm like, the, so we got a whole congressional black caucus and they couldn't lobby to make sure black folks got 30 billion too? Or more? Right. We'll just go back to the um let's go back to the first stimulus package that you were referring to. When black businesses were knocked out, uh you just said 41% of black. I think we had one point 
one million black businesses. Half of those were wiped out because of COVID. Uh, we really didn't get our fair share of the um, stimulus package. Black businesses were not able to uh, access the um, payroll protection program for for many reasons. But that's why the Congressional Black Caucus should have had a stimulus package similar to what the Native Americans just did. Each time there was a stimulus package, the Congressional Black Caucus should not have voted for those stimulus package unless there was those type of set asides, set aside for the American descendants of chattel slavery in those in those packages. And we need people, we need lawmakers to understand that. And the only way I think they're going to understand that is by voters and people like you and myself giving that message without um we, and so we threw a rally February 14th, and I'm part of an organization. Uh, Black Lives Matter Minnesota is part of an organization called the Reparationist Collective, which is org, uh, black organizations around the country that are fighting for reparations. And uh, we said, are y'all plugged in with Encobra? Um, a little bit, but not a whole. Uh, we do a little work with Encobra through the Green Party. We're plugged in with Encobra. Okay, let's talk about that because um, I, I certainly have plenty of contacts with the Green Party as um, my husband and partner is their Youth Commission co-chair for Encobra. And for people who are listening, Encobra is a national coalition of Blacks in America for reparations. And let me just um, acknowledge my, my sister and co-worker, Eklas. Um, absolutely, sister, you always correct me on this. My husband always corrects me on this. And thank you um, um, for sharing. We are uh, indigenous to this country as well. That's right. and, and that's my bad. So thank you um, for that um, loving correction. And so I definitely think that you should. Um, I, so I, I want these efforts. So you, number one, thank you for doing what you're doing in St. In St. Paul. Thank you for holding it down for us and, and all of us across the country. People are watching. Um, the reason why I brought up in Cobra is because they were very instrumental um, in pushing for the reparations uh, commission that passed in Evanston, Illinois. Are you familiar with that one? Yeah, they just passed the the official. Well, the first phase is said, I think Monday, yesterday. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. right. That's right. So Cam Howard is the national is the national male co chair for mm -hmm. Cobra, and you all would vibe really well. I think you and Cam would vibe really well. But Cam, I know Cam. Yep. Yeah, he lives. So you know, he lives in Chicago, and so he. Okay. Uh huh. So he worked directly on that Everson piece. Um, this is amazing. Um, I so so this is amazing, and 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 I'm also thinking about Sandy Darity, who was yes. in the back of my mind. Yes. Um, as you know, uh, 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 a black economist, a stratification economist down at mm -hmm. Duke University in North Carolina, and yep. he is in the back of my mind because. He applauds like all of these local efforts in California. I think there's a statewide effort. Mm -hmm. He applauds that here in Maryland, where I live in the D.C. region. Uh, Maryland has also introduced a bill on reparations. However, it did not move much. This um, General Assembly, Maryland has a strange General uh, Assembly. They only meet five months out of the year. It's really weird. Um, but anyway, <laughs> um, so there are these local efforts. Um, uh, uh, there are these local efforts, as you know, and statewide efforts. Sandy points out that he is concerned that we will push for the local and statewide uh, efforts, but we but we haven't uh, pushed for. Um, uh, I, but we shouldn't, I guess, get distracted and 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 not push for what the federal government owes us as well. Right. Um, yeah. Do you want to speak to that? Well, yeah, and I understand what um our resolution and we were understanding and because so I was elected to be the co-chair of the uh, Green Party United States Reparations Working Group. Okay. So the um. With that, that part of that is my the job is to pass HR 40. So the St. Paul Recovery Act calls for the St. Paul Recovery Act. What I like about how we wrote it is that it makes the city of St. Paul, our city council members, our reparations activists now. All seven city council members co-sponsored the resolution and it passed unanimously. And then the resolution calls for the city of St. Paul to 
advocate or to to work on passing reparations at the state and local level. So I, the city of St. Paul itself now is advocating for reparations at the state level and at the federal level. So um, that's how that's why going back to what Sandy Darity is talking about when these cities. Right. We can't wait. They've been trying to pass HR 44, 30, 40, I know. I know. <laughs> you know, and we can't wait. No, we can't wait another 30 wait years no for more. that right, to, right. to pass. So we maybe we can put a little pressure on the federal government by putting pressure on them by passing these resolutions and putting pressure on them at the local and state levels. So uh, absolutely. That's, we can look, we can walk and chew gum at the same time as the Absolutely. adage says, right? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> at the same time, we got to make it happen, and we are making it happen. Um, and I'm so proud of you. You intrigued me by talking about the Green Party, right? Um, mm -hmm. so I'll share, you know, I am certainly a recovering Democrat, I identify as an independent, and I have voted for Green Party candidates uh, in the past. In fact, uh, in 2016. Uh, I voted for the Green Party uh, for president. And I would love to know from your experience, um, how have you liked working with the Green Party? What are some of the, um, I guess, the major uh, chunks of your work? I really appreciate the fact that they're talking about reparations. I did not know that because they don't necessarily have, the media doesn't necessarily cover them like they cover Democrat and Republican parties. So I love to know, how did you get involved uh, with the Green Party and what attracted you to them? Well, reparations is part of the Green Party platform. So I, when I heard that, I was like, oh, wow, this is the party for me. And um, we, <laughs> uh because it is not a part of the Democratic platform. I just want to remind all of our listeners. OK, it's not. And even I know a few years ago, they tried to do it here in Minnesota and it it, it didn't pass. So um, but yeah, it was when I seen that the Green Party had um, reparations as part of his uh, platform. A lot of things when we talk about defunding the police, the, the Green Party talks about defunding the military. And a lot of times the military gives weapons to police departments. So it was a no kind of a no brainer for me. Um, the environment. Uh, I really care about the environment, but, you know, I'm not a tree hugger, but looking at the environment. So things like the north side, north Minneapolis, they had a, a thing over there called Northern Meadows that was polluting that neighborhood really bad, you know, here over in uh, 700 kids a year in Minnesota get lead poisoning. Wow. Uh, yeah, just things like that, making sure our water, we need, like you see what happened in Flint, Michigan and things like that again. So environmental racism is caused by public policy. Uh, we, play, we played football at Rondo for, for years, for generations, not at Rondo, but at Oxford for generations. Right. When the, when the wolves brought that, they dug it up and found out there was toxic waste under there and stuff. And we have been playing oh there. Oh my God. And that can cause asthma and all type of things. So I met Lena Bugs and she asked me to be her campaign manager. I was more involved in hip hop and things like that. But I'm telling even uh, kids right now who are doing music and doing stuff, the skills you're learning by doing music, uh, photography, even writing rhymes and all that stuff, those skills are transferable to politics. Um, so keep doing we got, to, we, got to, we got your Minnesota family uh, in the comments giving you a shout out. Shout out to brother Brandon Jones. Peace, <laughs> um, Mr. Jones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. Um, yeah, your Minnesota Institute. folks, yeah, they, they, they've been in the comments, um, you know, really, um, you know, enjoying this conversation. Just want to remind all the listeners um, to make sure you like um, you know, share the share this important discussion, you know, with your community uh, on social media and also subscribe to our YouTube channels. We really uh, appreciate that. And thank you all so much for listening. Um, also want to encourage you uh, in about five minutes, we'll, you know, be taking some questions from you all. Please post your questions as well in the comments and um, we'll try to get those answered for you. Um, so, you know, moving now towards um, what's what's going to happen towards the future for you right um and this this is a huge win again congratulations but as you know 
once you get things passed, that implementation process is a beast, right? Yes. Yep. So tell us a little bit about who are your people? Like where who is your network of support in the Twin Cities making sure that you all get this thing implemented the way that you all need it to be implemented and make sure that you get the right people on the commission? Can you share a little bit about that? Well, so the LAC, the, is that's going to be the Legislative Advisory Committee. And th that's one reason why I'm glad to be on this show, because we have to do the outreach to let the community know that this process this is happening. So the application, we're moving swiftly and the applications will be available April 1st. Uh, we're getting a website. The city of St. Paul is, is actually going to, is um, going to make sure that this is moving along and they're doing a good job. So they've already assigned us. Um, basically the city council is working with us and it's amazing. So they've assigned us uh, an employee who is helping us with scheduling, helping us with website building, um, and and they're keeping us on schedule. So we kind of have a schedule or plan laid out where by Juneteenth, we want this advisory committee to be up and running. Um, the resolution said within the next six months that it has to be up and running. Uh, so that would be Juneteenth, and that's, that's when that's gonna be. And in the meantime, I'm, we'll be doing this outreach to make sure that people are learning about the St. Paul Rec Recovery Act, and they learn and they know when to get the application, how to sign up, and thing and things like that. Also, at the city level, so and at the um, so we're looking at different. This isn't anything in stone though. But once the legislative advisory committee is set up, I would like to look at certain areas. I would see what the rest of the committee would say, but um. Health, wellness, and healing for Black families and community, education, um, business, the criminal injustice system. There's a housing component. There's a land component. So there's about ten or twelve components that I think we really need to look, look at. And then there's organizations who are already kind of doing this work, but it doesn't. It's they're not doing it through a reparatory justice lens. So trying to find those partnerships and things like that and start developing developing uh, reparatory justice policies and stuff. So uh, we were speaking to a group the other day and you're going to hear, we, they were giving us good ideals when they were saying things like, uh, you know, making sure that every person has a job and things like that. And those are good policies, but I don't know if those are reparations policies, right? So because we've had jobs for 400 years. We've been here working for 400 years. We've had skills 400 years. We built the White House. We built um, this country, basically, and you can't build a country if you don't have skills. So uh, those are some of the things that we're really looking forward to. That's that's amazing. And I like the fact that you're taking a really holistic kind of like approach um, to this. And you're um, very cognizant of the fact that people will try to throw everything in the mix and call it reparations. Is that, and that certainly is not. Uh, you know what it's meant to be. You know, I um, I always I am always concerned about the commissions. I appreciate the fact that you guys are doing an application process and not an appointment, because what happens is sometimes you know people will appoint people um, who will you know toe the line or whatever, do what they want them to do. But you guys seem to have a very democratic process where people apply. Uh, in terms of like who is reviewing the applications, are there community folks like yourself um, with the city council and mayor who would be making those decisions? Yeah, so there's gonna be like, a, we have a steering committee now. I see some of them chiming in. Uh, shout out to Rashad Turner. Uh, he's an educator who's on the uh, steering committee, but uh, it will be people like myself uh, in the St. Paul City Council so who will probably be reviewing the uh, reviewing those applications and stuff, and the kind of people that I would be looking for it's not it's not based on who I'm looking for, but I'm thinking we're going to need like you was talking about Sandy Darity, you know, we need some economists on there, we need activists on there, we need business owners on there, we need uh, and community members and people just from uh, educators need to be on there, and we need people from different backgrounds, but then we also want to make sure that they understand the racial wealth data and that they understand 
So this is what this is what we were talking about. Um, you know, having people, you know, you might have a black organization, and like you, like we were talking about, but it might have a do for self type of mentality, and that's good, but that might not be a right fit for the reparations, um, commission, right? So though, just kind of making sure that things are being looked through through a reparatory justice lens that we're not, this isn't charity. This isn't about charity. This is about justice. Um, this isn't, uh, you said you need, you're dumb, you need skills. No, you have skills and you need justice. And that justice is uh, economic, social, political, and economic justice. That's exactly right. Thank you um, so much for sharing that. Um, I'm really, again, just excited about all of this energy across the nation for reparations. Um, I don't think, at least not in my lifetime, and I'll be 40 this year, I don't think I've ever seen um, this much energy in a very, very long time. At least if there was some energy around, it was certainly when I was a child and wasn't paying attention. Um, mm -hmm. But certainly... I, this, um, you know what I mean? So um, I, this is this is amazing. There's so much energy around the nation in getting, you know, reparations. And like you said, report rep rep reparatory justice um, specifically for descendants of enslaved Africans. It's time. You know what I mean? It's time. Um, is there anything else you want to share uh, about other work that you're doing that also ties in to this repertory justice piece and and how can people who are listening and watching how can people really support the work that you all are doing for black folks in the twin cities in st paul well we're doing we're working with uh blm minnesota so we've been heavy behind uh make we want and just advocate for for derek chauvin to go to prison you know for for life and then that's huge and it's it's that's really big so the, the murder of George Floyd, we started the St. Paul Recovery Act before COVID-19 started and before uh, George Floyd was murdered by Derek Chauvin in Tutal. We, wow. uh, so when we started, we were first, we were meeting in person, you know, then COVID hit. BLM is Minnesota. We're uh, we're not associated. We're an independent. Mr. Turner's correct. hilarious. <laughs> like, let's get this clear. We ain't on all that BS now. Like we we not affiliated with the national. We independent, y'all. Yeah, he's one of the <laughs> founders too of that organization. Uh, we um, so when Chauvin, we were already doing the same part recovery act. Then COVID kicked in, and wow. then that amplified why reparations was so important too. Because Isn't that right? the medical situations. And then even the vaccine, we don't want to take the vaccine because of our history. History with. of racism in healthcare. Absolutely. Exactly. Medical. I don't know if you read the book, Medical Apartheid. Jet, I did. I'm actually going to have the author on my uh, <laughs> podcast. I have a separate podcast from here as well. And the author, Harriet Washington, not sure if you know, but she just released another book in February talking about the eroding um, consent, medical consent. It's eroding. Again, mm. wow, yeah. that's awesome! I I love to hear that conversation. Let me know when you have that conversation, I please. Will. Um, so yeah, that's um, yeah, that's big. My fault. You, I lost my train of thought just thinking it's about okay. that. <laughs> so, yeah, there's um some of the other work we're doing. Oh, the St. Paul Recovery Act started before COVID nineteen hit in, so it kind of amplified why reparations was so important. But then we had to switch how we were meeting and stuff like that and how we were going to do our readings and everything like that. Then George Floyd was murdered by Derek Chauvin. And then that just exacerbated, you know, why we really, um, I think that was showed us why reparations were so important and how we have to address criminal, what we call the criminal injustice system in America. Uh, there's been 400 people, murdered by the police here only one person has been sent to jail and that person was I'm uh, sorry. African immigrant. I, I'm, I'm sorry I'm, I'm sorry I'm 400 people just in Minnesota murdered by the police yes damn I'm, only one person has been to jail and that's Muhammad Noor and he's black 
Of course, because so, he killed a white woman. Absolutely. So uh, this is why this is really, really, really important to get um, a conviction in this case, because this sets a new precedent and, it, and it's telling us that you can't kill a black per the police can't kill a, kill a black person and get away with it. Um, but it's we know sad that they, they didn't kill hundreds of us and, and got away with it. And uh, so tell thousands. me more about what the what the tenor of the neighborhood and, and just the temperature of the community. Um, those of us, you know, nationally, we have been bombarded with images of the uh, jury selection. How are people reacting uh, in the community? Uh, is there a sense of we're going to get justice or is there a sense of, OK, here we go again? you know, shenanigans, we, we, you know, do people feel like they're going to get justice in men? Do the black people feel like they're going to get justice um, in this case with Derek Chauvin? The people I talk to are a little, little, the $27 million being announced before the verdict has a people a little bit on edge, like it might, you know, we're happy that, that they got a record breaking settlement, but we don't, some people are concerned that it was announced and that that might um, they might try to use that for a mistrial. Uh, they do have more people of color on this jury than was on with the Philando case. I think there's six people, six people of color on this jury. Now with Philando, there was only two. And we know the out, you know, Giannis is working in Texas right now. So we don't want Chauvin to be working nowhere after this. We want him in prison. Like if I did that to somebody or you did that to somebody, we definitely be in prison and Derek Chauvin needs to be in prison too. Absolutely. Absolutely. So people are concerned about that case being announced. People are concerned about like, you know, the Ben Crump announcing the uh, money for the family. Don't think that was a good, uh, people are concerned about that, but hopefully, you know, so what I, what I would say is, and from the people I'm talking to is, uh, we're praying for the best and preparing for the worst. Damn. I hear you. I hear you. And, you know, I can say I know those of us from around the country, we stand with in solidarity with our family, you know, in the Twin Cities there in Minnesota. Um, it's y'all have been through a hell of a year, man. Y'all have been through a hell with COVID and with the protests. Y'all done been through it. And so Man. sending all the love, sending all the love. And I'm I'm just grateful that you still got the energy to fight for justice and you haven't allowed COVID and the fact that, you know, there was an uprising this summer to dampen your spirit for justice. You're, it seems to me that you're more motivated than ever. And I love that. I love well, that. And I am. But this is life and death, literally. Not Fact. just for, for all of us, though, you know, like the the median income for the black middle class family by 2053, is, it will be zero. So we're, you know, this is a crisis. Uh, we, so we, that, that's why we can't wait 10 years, 20, another 20, 30, another 20, 30 years of median income for black people. If we, like it took us 30 years to get HR 40 passed, we, we can't, we literally cannot afford another 30 years that it's that critical that we get this done now um one more thing i want to add about the green party is for me it was able i've been able at the local level it's a way to keep the democrat party fighting for the people that they say that they support you know we go out and door knock for them we phone bank for them um just with this last election if it wasn't for philadelphia Black Philadelphia matter. The black voters in Philadelphia matter. The black voters in Detroit matter. The black voters in Milwaukee matter. Georgia, they wouldn't have if those black people didn't go out in Georgia. They Georgia turned blue for the first time since Bill Clinton, I think. That was because of black people. Uh, we're not uh, the the special election. That's because of black people. So we know politics is an exchange. The first book we started reading with the uh, same. Paul Recovery Act was called The Debt by Randall Robinson. And he said every black voter yes, should have a I, thank you. I love Randall Robinson. That's one of my favorite yeah. books. That's amazing. And then the card should have the black agenda. And then when a politician asks you a question, you can pull out there. Or right now, you can just say, do you support reparations? 
because if they say no, then you say have a good day. And that's and that's how we need to start moving as a people, an agenda driven, politi politically mature people when we go to the polls uh, in the next two years. So if they don't if they don't pass um, H.R. 40 by April 30th, I think we need to start letting the Democrat Party know that we might start looking towards the Green Party. Well, you know, I've been on that. So, you know, I'm welcoming my family to come and join me as, as a former uh, Democrat, uh, you know, and usually these conversations end up being binary because black folks think that when you ain't a Democrat, you must automatically be a Republican. And it's like, no family, there's something called independent and there's something called mm. the Green Party. You know what I'm saying? You can be in the independent uh, and certainly. So this has been a... Um, an amazing conversation. I'm, I'm so grateful that you came on today and, and just shared all this powerful work that you all are doing uh, in the St. Paul area. I'm sure there's probably people listening like I didn't know there was a, such a strong black organizing presence in Minnesota of all places. Right. Yep, yep. <laughs> so, I see some of them in the chat here. So yeah, like we <laughs> everywhere. Y'all, We everywhere. Um, thank you so much. Um, share with the audience, like, where can people find you? Um, how can people support you? Um, and in what ways can people, like, really support the work that you all are doing uh, in, in St. Paul in the Twin Cities in Minnesota? Well, we're gearing up for uh, the Chauvin trial. So if you want to support with that, it's just Cash App, uh, Black Lives Matter. M N or BLM M M Cash Tap BLM M N. You can go to our website. It's www.blacklivesmattersmn.com. And then you can also join the Minnesota Green Party or the Green Party of the United States. You can go to uh, gp.org. Is the Green Party of the United States website. I'm the uh, chair of the Green Party of Minnesota. Our site is mngreens.org. You can sign up there to volunteer and things like that. Um, I don't want to just bang on the Democrats too hard because the city, St. Paul City Council, uh, Jay, the people were working. This was a bipartisan effort. Yeah, so shout let me out say to that. Them. Shout out to the St. <laughs> Paul to the Democrats. Thank you. The city, yeah, you guys just stepped up, and hopefully that that can rub off on on your uh, colleagues across the country. Um, but. Yeah. So and then if you want to get involved with the St. Paul Recovery Act, uh, you can reach out to uh, City Councilwoman Jane Prince. Nelsie Yang is uh, really big on that, too. All of the St. Paul City Council, uh, Tolbert. And then you can again, those applications will be out April 1st. Um, so please, black people, April 1st, go to St. Paul .gov. Uh, put in St. Paul Recovery Act and sign up to be on the committee. Uh, your input is going to be very valuable to this process. And then even if you're um, maybe not want to be on the committee, but you want to do what um, Zakiah is doing right now and set up a forum, we'll be needing to come to churches and talk to you and get your input on the pro So there's going to be, it's going to be a process and there's going to be a lot of ways to get involved but those are some of the, uh, and then my email address is trerncrows at gmail.com or trern at mngreen.org. Sorry, I'm so long winded. I'm just excited. No, that's to be amazing. That. I wanted you to get everything out. And let's it be really clear, family, for everybody who's watching from all over the country, um, people, uh, in St. Paul, Minnesota are the only ones who can apply to get on the recovery. So you all are welcome, like visit the website, but don't be trying to apply to get on the that <laughs> position and you live in DC. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> but we want to talk to as many people as we can about it and get the word out. And then hopefully you guys can do uh, the D.C. If you're in D.C., um, they were working on the D.C. Recovery Act. So let's let's do let's pass them at the local. Let's pass. Say, these well, who's working, who working in D.C. on the Recovery Act? What organization? Because, I mean, I live in the D.C. region. I live out in uh, the suburbs in Maryland. But what group working on that in D.C.? So I know there's a sister named Sean out there. Um, and then I know Mr. Cheeks actually designed the St. Paul Recovery Act for me after the D.C. Recovery Act. And he gave the D.C. Recovery Act and he had the word tariffs in there and he gave it to Amarosa. And then that's when Trump started doing all the tariffs and stuff like that. So 
Um, okay, yeah, we'll talk offline about that because I'm interested in who your connection is in D.C. because we have some D.C. activists that's working on UBI and things like that. I'm sure it would be news to them to know that D.C. has something similar around reparations that's being proposed. So I will Don't connect with you on li- offline. Yeah. Maybe via email or maybe, you know, we can just have a phone conversation, too. I'll um I'll just email you my phone number. And um, yeah. I will, we were I will, out there for Valentine's Day and we did a rally at the Lincoln Memorial and stuff. This Valentine's Day? This past one. Yeah. Yep, wow. Yep. So, yeah, let's connect and I'll I'll let you. I'll, um, yeah, we definitely got to connect because I want to get our D.C. activists in, in, in connection with that. Seriously, they need they need the, they need this act, the activism that I think that you're coming out of. If you're connected with cool, the people that I see chiming in, the D.C. people could definitely use you guys as help. Right. This is amazing. Thank you, Traren. This is amazing. We're proud of you. Um, we support you. Uh, and folks are going to continue. Um, yeah, the sister she's in DC, have not heard anything, so we're gonna definitely have to that bring info. that back. Yeah, we definitely have to bring that back. Reparations now, that's right, family. That's right, family. We appreciate y'all. Um, thank you, Traren. We're thank again, you. um, keep us posted on your progress. We want to be able to bring you back on, you know, once everything gets up and running. Um, to talk about some some wins, right? To talk yes, about ma'am. some things that are you know transpiring for the better uh, for our folks um, in Minnesota and St. Paul region specifically. Thank you so much for your um, your work. We appreciate you, and um, we'll be we'll we'll have to have you on again. Like I said, once you all get the ball rolling. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having us, and um, congratulations on this show. And I'll definitely share this everywhere. Absolutely. So well, uh, thank you all so much for uh, watching Building Power this week. See you all next week, Wednesday, same place, same time. Talk to you soon. Peace.